everybody. Uh, good evening, good morning, uh, and welcome to this uh, TAFE Talks. My name's Craig Robertson. I'm the CEO of TAFE Directors Australia. We welcome you to this TAFE Talks, New World, New Approaches, Lessons from Canada. We respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners whose land we're on, both across Australia, but also the traditional owners of lands in New Zealand and Canada. In the spirit of reconciliation, TDA acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, Islander peoples today. Our TAFE talk series are designed to bring new thinking and new approaches to the activities and priorities of TAFEs here in Australia. I was lucky enough to be on a webinar with Lambton College several months ago, where Judith Morris, one of our speakers, talked about the change they are bringing to their strategy and courses to be ready for the new world of work. There are many things we can learn from Canada. We also have some exciting developments here in Australia with partnerships between TAFEs and Microsoft, and we are keen to share those. So on that note, let's welcome our panelists. Firstly, we have Judith Morris, who's the former president and CEO of Lambton College. Welcome, Judith. Then we have Medhai Shedzevic, the uh, vice president, research and innovation of Lambton College, and I'm sure he will correct my pronunciation when uh, Shedzai gets to when Medhai gets to speak. Yasminka Nemet, who is the future skills lead for Microsoft Australia. Jane Truen, the executive director of education delivery at Box Hill Institute of TAFE. And Phil Kerr, the Executive Director of the Post-Secondary International Network, which we often call PIN, and is also an educational consultant at, at Otago Polytechnic College in New Zealand. There will be an opportunity for questions after each of the uh, presentations. On this occasion, though, we're going to use the chat function and we'll keep an eye on those chats um, through the presentations, and we will facilitate those questions at the, each of, uh, at the end of each presentation. So now let me hand over to uh, Judith and Medhai from Lambton College, who will share the journey and the rationale for the move of Lambton to what they call Industry 5.0. Thank you so much, Craig. And uh, Mehdi, if you don't mind sharing the um, presentation, that would be wonderful. Just take a second. Can you get that up in full screen? Ah, awesome. Fantastic. Thank you, Mehdi. And uh, again, thank you, Craig. And it is really a pleasure to be here uh, to learn a little bit more about uh, the Australian post-secondary system and, of course, to share some of the things that we've been doing in Canada and Lambton College specifically. I want to tell you that uh, what we're doing is, is not rocket science, nor is it and will it be new for, for some of you, but some of the term terms that we use may be a little bit different. And I also understand that you are quite interested in understanding some of the, um, perhaps the requirements of our ministry around some of the things that we're doing as well. So I will touch on that. Mehdi and I will share the PowerPoint. So we'll go back and forth a little bit just to make you call crazy. And, uh, and then we'll conclude and have questions and answers at the, at the end. So there you can see um, our beautiful, one of our beautiful new buildings. It's our athletics and fitness complex. So Mehdi, if you wouldn't mind, and going to the second slide. I want to tell you a little bit about uh, uh, Lambton College. Uh, first of all, we are um, one of the 24 community colleges in Ontario, Canada. Uh, we are probably on the smaller side of those colleges. You might have heard of Humber College or, or Seneca College. They're the largest colleges. 
However, um, we have a fairly big footprint in a number of, uh, of uh, areas and have really made, I think, a significant um, uh, footprint in some key areas, such as uh, international education, uh, applied research. You can see that our latest statistics in, have indicated that we're number one in research in Ontario and number two in Canada. We have been number one in Canada. I just want to say that. I'm a little bit of a bragger. I'm retired now, so I get to brag. Uh, and uh, we have had global awards um, for our NACTUS team uh, for the work they've done in Zambia and in our First Nations. And if you want to see any of the work that they've done, uh, please go on our website. It's, it's quite significant. And I know that in Australia and New Zealand, there are some amazing NACTUS teams as well. And so I'm sure you're aware of, of their work. And then if you would go to um, slide three, please. So, so this is this is just looking at core drivers, and and I'm going to center this a little bit for you. In 2019, um, we developed a five-year strategic plan at the college, and uh, in that plan, it was quite novel at the time to think about Industry 4.0, and uh, we really fought hard, and Medi was one of the key drivers as well uh, uh, to include Industry 4.0 in our vision statement because we knew that the world was changing rapidly and. And we knew we had to, to, to drive that change through um, lots of the technical, technical changes and the digital changes that were going to be persuasive, pervasive throughout the, um, the curriculum. And so, um, you know, as we marched down the road and we were doing really well, uh, COVID hit. So in, in 2020, uh, we were back on our heels a little bit, just as, as I know you have been and, and continue to be to some extent. And our five-year goals turned into two-year accomplishments. Um, you know, with the exponential impact of digitization as a result of COVID, educational goals have, have escalated and they have, they have been achieved in, in, a, in a very uh, significant time. And, you know, what we also got a sense of was the urgency of COVID and the urgency of 4.0 has now driven us to greater urgency and it has pushed us even farther and, 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 and in, in a more direct line. And so what we did, we spent um, this, the full semester in the fall of 2020, the senior team only, because we knew that the strategy had to come from the senior team. Uh, we spent it developing what we call project momentum. And project momentum is really what it is, is really about taking industry 4.0 and adding in humanization and inclusivity. So you see in the core drivers, we have ICT, digitization, automation data, that's all industry 4.0. And then the two, the bookends that are critically important are the ones that are, are ensuring that we move to that next step of 5.0. And what we got a sense of when we were really focusing on 4.0 was that the faculty mm, were a little bit hesitant about buying into 4.0. But we knew that by adding humanization and inclusivity, that we were going to appeal to those educators because they want to think about humans. They want to think about their students. They want to think about the, the um, employees that we are putting out into the world. They want to think about our graduates. And so when you think about that and the, the, the whole collaborative nature of education and, 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 and that important piece of humanity, that combination was not only important for industry 5.0, but it was also uh, gave us greater ability to actually um, impact and have buy-in um, with our faculty and our staff. And so I wanna show you a, a little bit of a video uh, called Project Momentum. And it was kind of a pro promo um, video uh, for our staff and, and certainly for our community, just to tell them what this was all about. So we'll roll the video, it just takes couple of minutes. The pandemic has been hard. But with adversity comes opportunity. Now is the time to be driven by digitization, automation and data to accelerate Industry 4.0. 
It's time to keep humanization at the heart of progress and elevate inclusivity. It's time to engage business and industry to create the active learners who will become an agile workforce. It's time to put students at the center of a personalized journey, one shaped by experiential learning and high flex courses and enhanced by diverse student life opportunities and accessible service delivery. It's time to enrich our community through immigration and power economic development through innovation and collaboration. This is the time to challenge, to change, to learn, to grow, now is the time for Lambton College. And so we hope you're inspired by that. And that will lead right into uh, the next section, which will be Medi's. Medi? Thank you, Judy. So as an introduction to Industrial Revolution, just a very quick touch on how uh, they're classified. Uh, from industry uh, uh, 1.0, which is about the steam power, and then moved on to industry 2.0, which was about the industrial revolution around the use of electrical uh, systems to create mass productions. And industry 3.0, it was about uh, use of electronics and information technology to automate. And the recent industry uh, 4.0, which is about the uh, fusion of technologies, physical, digital, and biological. Uh, and a little bit just talking about those technologies, I think it's going to give us some um, um, uh, information about that. What are these mega trends that really are running the industry 4.0? The biggest mega, the first mega trend is about the physical uh, change that is coming to our um, um, uh, factories and manufacturing sites, uh, use of, and also, and also as well as daily, daily lives, uh, use of um, autonomous vehicles, uh, advanced use of ad additive manufacturing. Uh, in various forms, uh, use of advanced robotics uh, in terms of uh, uh, replacing the humans uh, and uh, use of the precision of the robotics for, for manufacturing. And as well as in uh, many cases, they include the new materials as part of this mega trend, the physical mega trend, use of the smart materials, nanomaterials for various applications uh, is also a big mega trend as part of the industry 4.0. The second trend is about digital um, and Internet of Things, IoT, is definitely a very big uh, portfolio of the digital mega trend, blockchain and data science and use of data for um, AI um, and also machine learning activities and in integration and embedding those uh, technologies into various applications use of various digital platforms for different technology, for different applications, for health, education, uh, social, uh, cultural activities. These are also part of the mega trends of uh, mega trends number two under the digital category of industry 4.0. And the third one, which is really not much discussed and usually industry 4.0 more is about data and uh, also physical and automation side is a biological improvement uh, and technology uh, revolution that is coming through the biological uh, biological systems, whether it is about the genomic science, synthetic biology, and also use of data and algorithms for predictions, but the specific prediction for uh, biological science and activities. With combination of these three mega trends is really the force, the technical force behind the industry 4.0 is being um, shaped. Judy? Thank you, Mehdi. So you get a sense of, and I'm not sure whether you uh, understood this before, but uh, industry 4.0 has very much been driven by these mega trends and the technology that's behind it. And it's got all kinds of sort of square edges and, and uh, very technologically um, hard um, data, et cetera. And so you can see even by what I was talking about earlier, the technology has to move into the human centric uh, solutions for industry 5.0. And I like the quote that um, industry, uh, sorry, um, industry wired in October of 2020 said, um, as we are already experiencing the fourth industrial revolution and witnessing the economic disruption with technology advances like AI, blockchain, and crypto and IOT and others, the fifth industrial revolution is likely to turn our focus back 
to humanity. And that's in fact what we saw and what we see and what we understand will take us into this next um, this next uh, piece of our world. And will, as I said to you before, allow the uh, faculty and more people to really buy into this very solidly. And if you read about Industry 5.0, you will see that it is a lot about robots and how humans can work beside robots. But in education, it's more than that. And it's about taking, uh, well, we're going to get into it. So let's go to the next the next section. So, so we look at these, um, these different um, uh, skills that are absolutely required in, in education. And, you know, if you if you look at the ones on on my right, hopefully you're right as well, the essential employability skills, the, these are in fact the humanization skills, and to some extent, the inclusivity skills, and you see the ones that are that are actually bolded there are the ones that lend themselves more to those human skills, those social skills, those cultural skills that are such such, such critical um, of such critical importance in this new world. And and when you read about education and employability and education and and what industry needs, all you hear about are, are the need for students who can reason, who can critically think, who can um, stand uh, stress, can can. Uh, you know, bounce back and be resilient, COVID, 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 resilience, resilience. And so that that just in fact forms that um, industry uh, 5.0 world and that combination thereof is going to take us forward. So next, please, Mehdi. Um, and, and so what I'm going to talk to you, and we've, we've just given you kind of the basis of, of what we're talking about when we say industry 4.0 and industry 5.0, I'm going to tell you now a little bit about what Lambton College did. And so my piece is on the education 5.0 um, uh, section, and uh, it's going to talk, we're going to talk about learning theory, which is absolutely the critical piece of education, development, and delivery, as they, those are the key components. And then Mehdi is going to talk about industry and uh, and engagement with uh, employers and, and how critical they are to Industry 5.0. Thanks, Mehdi. And so Education 5.0 flexible and inclusive um, education. And this is pervasive through, through all the lear learning theories. Everything has to be flexible. Everything has to be uh, inclusive. So we mean, mean individualizing wherever possible. Um, reflective of not just cultures, but reflective of learning preferences and, 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 and learning differences and reflective of truth and reconciliation and in indigenous, uh, in the world of the indigenous education. So it has to be, uh, both of those things. And really a lot of the focus has been on competency-based education. And so when we've you know, um, been focusing on um, micro-credentials uh, uh, for the most part uh, related to competency-based education, but moving more into our diplomas and our certificates as well, but, but their work in micro-credentials, and I, I'm sure you know what a micro-credential is, and, um, but in Canada and in Ontario specifically, I just wanted to tell you about how uh, we've been working through micro-credentials, just the, the kind of the standards that are around it. Um, we have a consortium called eCampus and it's 46 institutions. So it's all of the universities and all of the colleges within Ontario. And that group has gotten together to make, to develop a definition for micro uh, credentials. If you want that definition, we're happy, of course, to share it. So, so we use that um, and to form the basis of our micro credentials. Um, we have an audit system that is run by the college system itself. It's not run by the ministry. And so micro-credentials fall under that audit, audit system, but it's meant to be, it's not meant to slow things down. It meant the, all those QA processes around micro-credentials are meant to hold to the quality, but they're also to be fast and responsive. And finally, the ministry has not put a whole lot of parameters around the micro, micro credentials. The only place they have done that is when they have actually provided funding. So I think we're one of the few um, provinces and probably countries where our ministry has decided they are actually going to provide student support uh, for micro credentials, which I think has been incredibly, incredibly helpful. And many of our, or all of our micro credentials, in fact, are, are developed through our Innovation Institute. So what we decided in 2019 when we developed the strategic plan was 
um, we, we, we knew that the academic um, uh, world um, was slower. Uh, in fact, you know, the post-secondary is one of the last bastions of, of movement, I think. Um, but of course, in understanding that the ac academic world is slower to move to things, um, we developed an innovation institute where we could in fact um, incubate and innovate. And then once we had developed things, we transfer them over to the academic world. Doesn't mean there isn't a two way street, but a lot of the work that is responsive, fast, flexible happens in our innovation institute. And Mehdi heads that up for us and he can answer questions that are related to that. And then we move into um, the development. And, and so, uh, you know, it's all about um, relating to industry, all, all about making sure that we are up uh, uh, and, and clear on the labor demand. Uh, it, everything has to be developed in, in consultation uh, with our, our industry partners. And so how do we do that in Ontario and how we really focused on that? Well, every single program, and maybe it's the same with you because I couldn't didn't delve down quite as far as that in your um, on your websites, but every single program uh, has to have a program advisory committee made up of a number of industry representatives in that specific area. Research is critical to this. When we do research, it is not theoretical. It's not a discovery research. It is applied research, and we cannot do any projects uh, unless they are. We have a partner in business business or, or industry. And we have partnerships, 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 entrepreneurial with developing companies, etc. And all of this feeds into the uh, relevance and the responsiveness of our new program development. And all the new program development happens in our Innovation Institute, although a lot of the ideas are coming from the academic unit as well, Go back, going back and forth. Um, as well, um, we have, uh, of course, the, um, the essential employability skills, and it's critical that every piece of curriculum that is developed includes those essential employability skills. Some of our micro-credentials will, in fact, do that as well, but they can't, you know, the list is long, and so they will not uh, include every single um, uh, employability skill. And then when we get to delivery, um, just so you know, all of our programs, because it's so critical if you're going to have the human element in things, that you have experiential learning. And, and it's a critical to apply learning. It's, it's, it's uh, all of our uh, raison d'etre, I, I am sure. But this goes beyond traditional placements and, and co-ops. And we get into things like capstone um, uh, projects and research. And, and Mehdi can tell you a lot more about this. But they, this has been incredibly positive for our students in really pulling together industry with our students and having an actual hands-on learning experience in the college and outside of the college. The delivery has to be, has to be, has to be flexible. You know, we're trying to meet uh, students where they are. Um, we focused some time on high flex. Many of you will know what high flex is, a hybrid plus uh, hybrid uh, education plus flexibility. Students can take, um, you know, they can decide one day if they wake up that they don't want to go into the, the college and, and sit in their classroom. Uh, in fact, they've got a doctor's appointment or whatever. They do it virtually. Uh, but the students who are in the classroom, they uh, also collaborate with the, the students who are virtual. And, and that whole um, student uh, learning experience is done in a variety of different ways with a, a variety of different teaching methodologies, but, but based on, on the student's needs at that time. You know, I know we all know about online, it's synchronous, asynchronous, we're looking at gamification, we're talking social media, we're talking videos, and of course collaboration again is all part of that. And then we get into advanced technologies and, um, you know, we're, uh, many of us are using AR, VR, we're using big data to personalize and also to um, get a sense of the learner experience and tailor it to the learner experience. Gamification, as I said before, but I just want to mention a little uh, a shout out to PIN, uh, uh, one of the um, uh the opportunities that we've had through PIN is to collaborate with a number of other uh, colleges. And so Lambton College is developing a cybersecurity app. So for first year students, it's ensuring that they have the skills to um, access the, um, uh, the resources, the, the technical or the digital resources of the college. 
and it will be done in a game gamified way. And we had we've had lots of fun pulling that together with four uh, four colleges in U the U.S. and and Canada uh, working together on that project and sharing our resources as well. And um, a lot of this work in the delivery is, is going to be hatched in our, um, in our incubator, which is really uh, the immersion room where a lot of the um, technologies that are more advanced will be tried um, by faculty, by students, by marketing, by whomever, and then transferred into the classroom so that they can really enhance um, that learning experience and that, that human piece of it all. And then finally, we get into credentials, and and because we want um, you know them to the students to have a flexible experience, we have to offer um, just you know the full spectrum of credentials. And so we're looking at micro credentials, certificates, diplomas, advanced diplomas, post grad certificates, degrees, and many many more. And I just want to have one. I want to share one story about eBits, which we learned uh, all about from Phil Kerr and, uh, and New Zealand. And I lost, I just can't remember what your, your eBits used to be called, um, but we changed the name obviously. And these are small bits of learning um, made to really attract others into the learning experience. And during COVID, what we did was we developed a hundred uh, more or more eBits. So a little piece of learning that teaches a student to um, maybe bake a cake or maybe at one accounting principle in an hour, an hour and a half. And they're all mostly done in virtually. Sometimes they're, they aren't, but in this case, they were all done virtually and they were all free free for any uh, person in, in our area. And, you know, we're from a, a, a small county of about 145,000, and I think we had 17,000 registrations. And the intention, of course, is to provide that pathway into the college and, and to make the, the college um, accessible and, 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 and meaningful for our community as well, and to bring them into this new world of Industry 5.0. And so I'm going to ask Mehdi to go to the, the next slide where he will tell you a little bit more about the work that we're doing with community engagement and research. Thanks, Mehdi. Thanks, Judy. Um, so as, as we know, and as we are talking about how Industry 4.0 and 5.0 have impacted education system and the way we are training our students, the same way they are impacting everybody in our community, in, our, uh, in the industry, uh, that we have um, in our community as well as the region and province. So the colleges have started in Canada, started doing collaborations uh, with, with, uh, with the community in various ways. And they are uh, truly becoming a community partner in many initiatives. So the community engagement is very strong in, um, in many, many different initiatives, but particularly some of the areas that it impacts sort of uh, touches on the industry 5.0 and bringing the humanity back and the support to, to, to the uh, impacted people is uh, as follows. Uh, one thing that we found out is uh, due to the industry 4.0 and 5.0 impact, many of uh, initiatives within the community, in particular socioeconomic ones, uh, they require innovation, they require rethinking, they do require assessments and evaluations. Um, and for example, Sarnia Lampton, uh, due to the changes in the industrial sector that we have, very uh, is, a, is, a, is a town, is a community that is, was very really industrial with respect to the chemical and refining industry. That has changed gradually in the last 20 years when we see that there is a huge growth in the area of clean tech and particularly bio clean tech area. And we played, Lampton College played a huge role as as a place for workforce development, as well as providing the research to those companies that are attracted to our community. So this created jobs uh, for our community. We also uh, uh, started and um, sort of there was the leader in, in building the initiative for our community to establish an information technology cluster under the partnership called Innovation Bridge. So the hope of the Innovation Bridge is to build a cluster of companies locally or attract from outside and internationally to Sarnia Lambton uh, to, to do their business. This provides, of course, jobs opportunities for the community as well as to our students and graduates. So uh, we became a socioeconomic driver for our community uh, and the job creator. And part of this also, some of those projects that we do, it creates jobs directly. 
the research uh, within the Lambton College just uh, uh, created almost 100 staff jobs, uh, part-time staff or full-time staff to do those research projects, as well as 360 jobs for students and graduates. So you can imagine that we're talking about 400 plus jobs that uh, Lambton College created outside of the education in engagement with the industry and our community. There is a significant uh, uh, focus on the environment in our community and Lambton College provides uh, support with respect to education, doing research, we are involved in various uh, projects uh, with the various groups, our uh, municipality, non for profit organization, with respect to our lakes, water quality, air quality, and the safety, that there are certain things that we are uh, heavily engaged to provide that environmental support that is really impacted or brought by the industrial revolution. There is a very strong focus with respect to in indigenous engagement and support, uh, and this comes in the form of education. Uh, we had entrepreneurial activities and training for our indigenous communities, as well as many research projects that we are doing with them. Uh, for example, we did a project on the economic leakage that is happening in our indigenous communities and finding the roots of this challenge and providing some solutions. Recently, we have started a project with respect to gamifying of the culture of uh, the indigenous communities that we have, creating the games, building a platform that can be actually easily adjusted and adopted for other communities. Uh, so the engagement with our indigenous communities is, uh, is cultural, is social, is technical, uh, and we are growing that activity. Uh, also, we realize that uh, the, our communities are, yeah, our, our government, local governments are impacted by uh, industrial revolution and they require support. And the, the, they have projects that is related to our community from the uh, technical point of view, the, the water systems, uh, what, the wastewater treatment facilities that they have. Uh, we, the, uh, in terms of the operation, there are certain challenges in the, let's say, parks and rec tourism. There are certain health and security and safety challenges that they have and the initiative that they have. So we build a partnership with locals, uh, with, uh, with Sarnia City, as well as the Langton County, which is the county, including your 11 municipalities, to help this community, the partners, to bring their projects to Sarnia and use their student and graduates and faculty and staff knowledge to uh, provide solutions to them. Uh, the solutions can be in terms of a recommendation, it can be in terms of the strategic plan, or it can be actual the tangible physical activity or prototype that we are building for them. So the variety of activities are under the civic lab. Many of this becomes actually experiential learning opportunities. Some of these projects are not big enough to be a research projects to be moved them towards our community, to, to our students as a capstone projects or, or uh, any course-based activity, even working digital learning activities. But we are very engaged to use this opportunity to support our community and provide at the same time real life examples for our students and graduates. And also one of the very big area for supporting the community that is impacted by Industry 4.0 and 5.0 particularly is providing and reskilling and upskilling the populations that we have. Many people lost their jobs because of automation, because of the digital technology. And the, the hope is that we can reskill them, we can upskill them too, so they can be ready for other jobs. We are heavily engaged in corporate training, but in a very uh, sort of a fluid and, and, and continuous corporate training that collaborates easily with the online training, collaborates easily with the academic side, uh, and we, we are using various tools, online tools, hybrid tools, various advanced technologies to provide that upscaling and reskilling. Many of those trainings have become macro credentials for us. We are at, the, and these are not technical, some of them, they are actually, some of them are actually more on the social side. We are engaged on the health sector with various types of upscaling and reskilling activity, but overall, college is playing a very big role with respect to skill development and reskilling of our uh, population to, to, uh, to move and uh, sort of uh, embrace the, uh, the, the changes that has come to us because of the industrial revolution. As a summary, college is becoming, uh, becoming economic and socioeconomic engine for our community. 
We are economic prosperity usually depends on industrial attraction and industrial diversification and, and entrepreneurship knowledge and local industry initiatives and colleges. And in, the, in this particular case, Lambton is playing those or contributing to all of those through partnership development, bringing various infrastructure to our community to, to do education as well as provide research and development to our community partners, industry and, uh, and, and municipalities. We provide access to our skilled people and we develop a, a skilled workforce for our community. And also one important thing is that we don't talk too much is actually colleges are playing a very big role to promote the community. And um, just Judy mentioned about the ranking in the research. This is something that um, is quite important in a way that everybody within the community is quite proud of the ranking and they, that helps from the promotion point of view, even it has an economic impact for our community. Julie? Thank you, um, Mehdi. And so um, we hope that we have been able to share a little bit about what we're doing to not only embrace Industry 4.0, but move uh, our toe uh, into uh, the next uh, uh, realm, which is Industry 5.0. And, um, and we certainly hope that you have some, some questions for us because we're open to that. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Judith and Mehdi. That's, that's fantastic. And uh, inspiring for all of us uh, here in Australia, just seeing the um, the way that you've you've gone about it. They are very similar challenges to the way that um, uh, the, the that TAFEs are facing in Australia. And I really hope that out of this, we'll be able to create some dialogue between individual TAFE staff and um, and Lambton College because there's so much that we can learn um, and exchange. There are there have been a couple of questions. There has been a request. I think you offered to uh, provide the definition around micro-credential. I think we can take that offline and we can, um, uh, we can uh, organise that. Uh, there was a question though about trying to dig a bit deeper into the collaboration with local industry. Did it end up being about sharing uh, some of your space with local industry? I wonder if you could explain on that a bit. Sorry, Craig, I didn't hear what you said just at the end there. Uh, sorry, so the, the, the question is around how do you engage with industry? So, so did you have some of your facilities made available um, or did you go to, go to industry? Uh, that, that's, what, that's what people are interested in hearing about. Okay, for sure. And, you know, Mehdi is the um, expert there, so I'll leave it, ask Mehdi to respond. Sure, thank you. It, uh, it varies. There are very different, various different forms we are using it. Uh, industry, we do have some level of incubation, not mainly incubation of the local administration of the companies, mainly for technologies. We have a pilot facilities that they can come. We work together within that pilot facility to build prototypes, build pilot plans and run them and test them for them. We, we also have a very strong collaboration with the research park at Sarno Lambton that we actually use their facility also for piloting. We also, not at the college, but now I remember that we do have some level of incubation of industry at the research park in collaborations with our uh, research park, which is a county uh, organization. We provide lab space and office space with some of those industries as well. So the collaboration, um, we provide those services, but most of the collaborations is in a way that the company has an idea or has a challenge. They provide that to us. They work collaboratively with our researchers and our researchers are using our many facilities uh, and labs and uh, equipment to develop that technology or test and validate the technology and then return that knowledge back to the company because that's an intellectual property policy to return it for, to the company so they can actually commercialize it. Excellent, thank you. And I'm going to finish off on a note from a comment here from um, uh, Kevin Hayes, who says Lambton is inspiring, a uh, great connection. Um, and then he goes on to ask about um, your work in COVID. We're, we're running out of time there, but um, I really do think that over the next couple of years, um, so some of us in um, some types are very lucky to visit some Canadian colleges in, in um, Ontario. Um, 
was that beginning of 2019. Um, and once travel is returned, I think it would be really fantastic to be able to create some of these um, connections. So I really do want to thank you, Judith and uh, Menhai, for that, that presentation and the video. Uh, pretty darn inspiring. So, so well done on that front. Um, we're now going to turn to a little bit of an Australian flavour and uh, and then we'll finish off with hearing from Phil Kerr. Uh, we've um, been doing some work between, facilitating some work between Microsoft Australia and, and several TAFEs uh, with the lead from Box Hill TAFE um, and we're wanting to be able to hear about that. Now we all know that digitisation is impacting um, large parts of the Australian economy. Uh, and we also know that in the Australian economy, which I'm sure is very similar to the Canadian economy, over 95% of our businesses are small, um, uh, small enterprises, small number of employers, uh, and also our economic activities in the services sector, around 80% of that. So digitisation and humanisation has a real role to play in activating um, industry and activating um, businesses so they can transform and really um, maintain themselves at the cutting edge of what's going on around the world. So on that note, I'm now going to hand over to um, Yasminka and Jane for their presentation. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Craig, um, and also to Judith and Medi for um, just some fantastic ideas that you presented, and in, in particular, just um, highlighting the importance of putting humans at the centre of this uh, digital transformation we're in. And I think starting starting with students um, is is the right place to start. Um, so actually, I'm going to start with a, a quick uh, personal story. Uh, and I'm going to take you back to 1970 when my parents moved to Australia from Croatia. Um, to add to the challenge of arriving here with just $10 and not speaking English, my father, um, who'd been planning to be a labourer, uh, suddenly found himself out of work following a near fatal car accident uh, that we were unfortunately all uh, involved in. My parents didn't just have to pivot, to use the, the most over, overused word of 2020 and, and 21, they had to somersault. Um, and after many years of recovery, somehow from somewhere, my mother started her own small business and my father joined her. They had to learn a lot of new skills. Uh, they had to learn to run a business. They had to learn to hire people. They had to learn to be accountants. Um, and although my parents retired at age 50, um, and have been self-funded retirees ever since, even with all their success and grit and hard work, I've heard them say, we did not reach our full potential. Uh, yes, they provided jobs for, them, uh, for themselves, obviously, and for a handful of people uh, for which they should be enormously proud. Um, and they were comfortable personally. Um, but you know, what are, what are their reflections about what held them back um, and how could they have done more? And I can tell you, uh, it wasn't a lack of ambition, determination, and certainly not a lack of hard work on their part. I, I can attest to that because I was a kid in that small business. Uh, what they uh, now recognize though, um, is that they didn't know what they didn't know. And what they didn't know is how to scale their business. They lacked skills in personal productivity, automation, marketing, process innovation, all sounds very familiar, I know. Um, and because they didn't have those skills, they didn't know how to find them easily in others either. They didn't know what they didn't know. Um, I'm telling this story today because I think even though it's you know 40 years old, it's still relevant and it, and it still resonates um, along a number of thematic lines. I think not knowing what we don't know is the greatest risk for all of us when it comes to digital skills and potential for technology to widen opportunity, not to create disparity. Um, but if we don't learn these skills, the skills of scale, which are now without question digital skills, people and businesses without them will not reach their full potential or worse, won't even get close. We're seeing this worldwide with the massive and growing gap in wealth generation. Those who know how to participate in this digital economy, who have digital skills are finding their way through the hardest of times. Those that don't are getting left behind. And businesses that were digitized at the beginning of this pandemic kept growing, even exceeded expectations. 
those that weren't are either barely hanging on or they're gone. Now that disparity disturbs me greatly and it disturbs Microsoft greatly. And we want to address it in partnership with the education sector. While we're obviously invested in future developers and data scientists, of course we are, uh, we're actually equally invested in future construction workers, hairdressers, health workers, and everyone in between who's going to contribute to uh, the small and medium businesses that are running our country. How do we prepare everyone to know what they need to know so they can uplift themselves and others? And how do we end underemployment? Uh, just a huge tragedy in my view. Uh, cybersecurity being just one example where demand is rapidly exceeding supply. So it's, uh, it was with these problems to be solved in my mind that I had the good fortune to meet Jane, uh, to meet Jane Truen from Box Hill uh, through an introduction actually from the TDA. We talked and pretty quickly around, uh, aligned around what we now call a no-brainer. And I, I believe you'll hear Jane talking about that in a moment, <laughs> um, that students would benefit from learning digital skills they would need in the workplace that could benefit their employers instantly as part of their education. Jane didn't say, no, sorry, we can't squeeze that into our courses. We're already doing too much. She said, let's find a way because this is obvious and important everyone at some point is going to be using these skills and tools in the workplace why wouldn't we find a way to teach them i think that's the right question so to move forward and test the theory that students will in fact benefit from learning these skills as part of their education and to figure out how best to do this we decided to run a pilot with the help of our partner prodigy learning uh, which jane will talk to you about in in more detail the starting point was to identify training packages that could benefit from the addition of Microsoft skills. Again, ICT is a no-brainer, so we figured that one out very, very quickly. Uh, but how about health services? How about the trades? What about business administration? What digital skills could those students benefit from? Could some of the skills they learned uh, lead them to another pathway like cybersecurity once they gained more confidence and competence with those digital skills? What we're now piloting is the delivery of Microsoft skills at Box Hill, where students will have the chance to learn uh, not just the new skills in, in the context of, the, of their chosen field, but they're actually going to earn a Microsoft certification, which is recognised by employers globally. On paper and in practice, this will be a true differentiator for these students. And I know this because our partners and customers prize these certifications. They're a really important signal of competence in the tools that those businesses have invested in to scale their businesses. So of course, they're delighted when they see these credentials uh, on a LinkedIn profile or on a resume. And again, on a personal note, um, I'm really excited for these students because by gaining this one industry certification, they'll have become competent in a tool that will not only be useful in the workplace or in their own business, uh, but they're actually going to do uh, something really important, which is to create a footprint for the lifelong learners they're going to have to be to thrive in the digital economy. And by becoming competent in just one technology, students will develop another very important skill to look for other technology solutions to solve problems, to become curious about how technology is going to help them to be able to find out what they don't know. Uh, and on a side note, I've seen students uh, just gain enormous personal pride and confidence uh, when they've mastered a digital skill and been able to obtain a badge or a certification. And none of this at any time is to suggest that um, a certification like this could replace a certificate, a diploma or a degree. Um, absolutely not. But it can be a fantastic complement and provide motivation to continue to earn and achieve additional credentials. It's a solid stepping stone um, or even a part of a micro-credential, which uh, is a hot topic I know we've touched on, but that's for another day. Uh, so before I give Jane the floor, let me also say that Queensland TAFE, TAS TAFE and TAFE South Australia are also participating in this pilot, which we're absolutely thrilled about. Um, they're each configuring Microsoft skills to a different training package. So like Jane, their executive leaders recognise this is an opportunity to add enormous value for their students. Together, we're going to document <clears throat> the approach and outcomes of each pilot because everyone is slightly different um, and share them widely so that others can either replicate or adapt as they see fit. 
Um, I see these pilots very much as a beginning, not an end. Um, our vision over time is to attach work integrated learning opportunities, guest lectures, industry case studies, uh, to give students an ever richer industry experience in the context of their education. And through these ever richer experiences, uh, paired with immersive digital learning environments like the ones that uh, Judith and, and Medi referred to, really help students start to develop um, essential enterprise skills such as collaboration, communication and networking. Networking uh, is one of the, the most important skills they need to learn from industry and through industry. Um, and I'd also love to track the impact of these pilots on employability, uh, which is also a topic for another day. So with that, um, thank you for taking uh, an interest in what we're doing uh, with these pilots. And let me pass the mic to Jane uh, to talk to you about the specific approach at Box Hill. Thank you, Yasminka. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, Craig, for inviting us to present today. Um, we'll go to the next slide, thanks. So while that's coming up, um, one thing I was really fortunate to be asked to represent um, certainly to oh we've gone to the second slide no that's okay all right yep okay thank you uh we, i was very fortunate to be asked um to represent uh, well victoria in a way as box hills just one of the the many tapes um down in victoria but what we have really um was found that we're very excited about this pilot was the opportunity to actually um, look at seeing whether we could Im embed that within our courses, um, whether it's at the start of the qualification, um, throughout the qualification or at the end. So when Yasminka first touched base with me, um, she said, you've got 50 students um, in each pilot. So each state was given 50 students and they could be all in one group or they could be spread across two different um, certifications. So we decided to um, go with the two different certifications. One, which was a no brainer, the IT area. So we focused on a group of our cybersecurity students. And the second group was um, in our health sector uh, where they had to do a lot of presentations. And so we looked at um, the Microsoft PowerPoint certification for that one. So using the, um, the Microsoft products through a Prodigy learning platform, there was eight categories that we could have chose these certifications from. So they had a suite of 55 programs um, and they range through Microsoft Office, Adobe, Business and Accounting, Fundamentals, Technology Associate, Certiport, Autodesk and CompTIA. So there was, there was plenty to choose from, but we thought it would be great to just start with something that we could really um, dig our heels in and really look in depth and, and see whether it's going to be of value to enhancing their full qualification that they were completing. So for the IT students, we picked the Azure Fundamentals and, as I said, for the Health, the PowerPoint certification. Um, the students, they will undertake um, the Prodigy Learning's uh, four-stage learning pathway. So the first thing they do is a skills analysis where they determine um, if they have any weak spots. So the whole idea with these is um, they can actually focus on the gaps in their training. And in some cases, they might be quite competent in other, in other parts of it as well. Then the learning resources is like a full motion digital video anytime, anywhere, as long as you have internet connection. So it's a single sign on. Um, it's all on pro project based learning lessons and hands on activities, um, which include things like videos, case studies um, and lots of different types of activities. The third stage is where they do practice tests and in those practice tests, um, they we usually like to say, well, you need to at least achieve 80% before I would go for the final, final certification exam. So the courses, they vary between 10 hours and 60 hours. Um, but on average, they tend to be around 20 to 30 hour um, online courses that they deliver. Um, we'll go to the next slide, thanks. So the pilot, um, so learning is to take place in a self-paced student-led environment. And during that time, our educators uh, will observe and provide support if needed. They are set up that they can do them fully online in their own time without a teacher um, support person, 
but we thought it was valuable throughout that pilot that we actually had the, the educators monitoring them and, and seeing how they were progressing through those courses. Because our intention in the future is it will be a fully online um, offering and it may consist of being offered alongside, as I said, or um, within the course or at the start of the course before they commence. Um, the practice exams um, for the pilot will be held on campus. Um, and then after that, they'll do their certification exams at a later date. Um, successful students uh, will receive a digital badge from Microsoft, as Yasminka mentioned, and students and staff will then be asked to provide feedback in a survey afterwards and, and as much commentary as they want to include. So the whole point of the pilot is to really um, drill in and find out what they found valuable, whether we found it enhanced their qualification, um, at what point in time where we introduced this course, was it relevant? Was it appropriate? Would it have been better at a different time in, throughout their, their full qualification? Um, so BHI will evaluate the pilot and the value of introducing Microsoft cert certification um, more broadly after this is all completed. And I have to say there's been an awful lot of interest um, in the pilot from both students and educators. And we certainly look forward to educating our educators in the future using these products. Um, it really is my intention to try and look at where we can enhance these digital skills um, with all our programs, especially throughout COVID when we went remote overnight. And what we found, you know, throughout that last 12 to 18 months is, you know, the, the digital literacy and those digital skills, where those gaps are. And um, it was very easy to actually pinpoint some of these situations, especially when we were doing it through video conferencing and that until we had online um, fully developed in some of the products. Um, before COVID hit, you know, we didn't have a lot of online products at Box Hill, and I've got to say we've got an awful lot now, but, um, but it was really, you know, these short, sharp skills are very, very important. We've just recently also set up a, um, a framework for micro-credentials, and uh, part of this is to look at um, this sort of Microsoft suite as a specialised credentials that stands across to the side, um, beside our core and our specialised credentials. But um, we'll go on to the next slide, thanks. Got about one minute, Jane, can we? Okay, so just on our stakeholder engagement, Prodigy Learning, we did a deep dive. I put a project manager on who did um, a lot of work with the Prodigy team, providing details on the activities that what was required. The faculties then nominated staff to support activities to monitor the pilot. Um, and then they recruited the, the students um, for the pilot as well. Our IT information technology services, they were involved as well to ensure the technical requirements were met and the software installation and all that type of thing. And then having to have an MOU, we went through due diligence on the software. Um, we made sure we had privacy consent forms done for the participants. Um, and at the pilot completion, you know, we will compare the outcomes to the other states and we will see um, certainly, you know, what they what they thought and their, their approach is different to what we're doing. And as Yasminka said, on different courses. So, but probably just to finish on, um, it, it's just really clear through this pilot as well. It's just not for the workforce of tomorrow, but it's definitely for the workforce of today. And the expectation is that our students and our staff um, we'll have these digital skills now. Um, so that's why we were very excited to be involved in the pilot from Fox Hill Institute and we're finding it really interesting and uh, we look forward to the end results. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jane, and thank you, Yasminka. That is incredibly um, exciting, particularly for those students. And uh, you can see there's some uh, chat there, we don't know what we don't know, or the accelerator impact. Uh, of, of digital. And that's why TAFEs across Australia are really pleased to be uh, involved in this. And it'll be hopefully that we can um, accelerate it even further as we learn from um, this pilot. So a, a huge thanks to uh, Microsoft. It was just a casual connection at some point, Yasminka. So hope you can see that um, when TAFEs get behind something, they can achieve something. So that's, uh, that's really good. Uh, I'm just going to go over a little bit over 11 o'clock because what I do want to do is uh, give the opportunity to hear from uh, Phil Kerr. 
Um, those who know Phil uh, from a long time, you could probably call Phil Mr. Micro-Credentials because he was talking about micro-credentials quite a while before it became the new buzzword in, um, in many countries. So he's kept himself at the forefront of what's going on, particularly in, um, uh, in tertiary education. But um, this webinar has really come about because of a connection through PIN. Um, uh, which I had the opportunity to listening to listen to um, Judith um, on that occasion. So I want Phil to just have an opportunity to talk about PIN and some exciting opportunities to be involved in that. And your microphone, Phil. Thank you, Craig. Uh, really appreciate this opportunity and uh, uh, appreciate uh, the folks um, uh, online. Um, tolerating a quick advertisement. Uh, so I'm the executive director of PIN, the post-secondary international network. Um, we have a strategic uh, relationship with the World Federation um, and we're responsible for um, the uh, leadership affinity group and its program of development. Uh, PIN is a boutique organization um, focused on leadership development for executives, but leadership development that's about thinking, thinking through issues, um, looking at innovations, sharing, uh, and of course, um, as has been highlighted, um, uh, in a way, this uh, webinar is a result of that. And uh, Judy, um, edubits was the, uh, the one that you um, converted into ebits. Can I say, I have a colleague uh, doing a doctoral study on micro-credentials. Um, I'm, I'm hoping I can introduce him to you, Judy. Um, and uh, if anyone else um, would like to participate in that study, um, flick, me, flick me a note, that'd be great. So really my job today was to say, hey, there are two PIN World Federation events coming up. Uh, one is the Leadership Summit, um, Maui College on Maui, um, and um, working on the assumption that borders uh, permit. Um, we're not quite sure whose borders permit what yet, uh, uh, we've got a pretty exciting get together sorted out um, coming up on October 18 to 22. The focus is leadership for sustainability um, and uh, with a focus on the sustainable development goals um, and tying that back into the, the today's context. Because um, those of you familiar with the, the 17 goals will know that um, there's a truckload of them that uh, relate really to the broader social context in which we operate. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> the second event is another up and coming webinar. The third of two, uh, the third of three, sorry, third of two, third of three. Um, these have um, proven to be um, very worthwhile. Um, and this one is looking at um, how uh, post-secondary institutions might reinvent themselves in this we, we started off saying the post-COVID world, but there's probably no such thing. Um, so it's post-COVID only to the extent that um, it's not the world that we had before. Um, and this is, a, again, a sharing of experiences and the promoting of ideas, uh, hopefully the planting of seeds. Um, in both cases, uh, just flick across to pinetwork.org, really easy to get to. Um, you can get all the details about both and about PIN itself. So thank you and back to you, Craig. Thanks, Phil, that's uh, really appreciated. Uh, so that has come to you from the benefit of a partnership between the World Federation of Colleges and Polytechnics, an organisation that I stand down from chair actually tonight, um, given I take on a new role after this, but the World Federation has been incredible influence and help for uh, tapes in Australia and that connection um, that we've achieved today into Lambton is I is something I hope is a feature going forward uh, for tapes across Australia because we can learn so much um, from in from interchange. I really do want to thank our participants, particularly Judith and Medhai from Lambton and Yasminka and Jane from here in Australia and, and also Phil. I personally think, and the, some of the comments that are coming through, we have found this today incredibly inspiring. For many of us in Australia who may well be locked down, wondering where do we get out of this COVID, but thinking through the critical role that TAPES will play, 
right across Australia um, for students, for industry and overall economic rebound and also social inclusion. And there can't be a higher order aspiration for all of us to aim for in the work that we do, even though we might be locked in our bedrooms at this particular time. So on that note, I do want to say thank you to all of our participants and what truly was a great session. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Bye, everyone.